things that he did in the summer, pumping soil on the farm, mowing lawns, and things like that. And I forgot to tell you what he, about the boys' teenage years earlier. They both had projects outside the home. Brian was a member of the scout troop in Avoca. That wasn't too good of planning because it began at 7 o'clock and Floyd wouldn't get home from work till 6 and have to eat and then he'd have to take him to meetings and times he was late he, they, they wouldn't go because the meetings only lasted till half past 8 so there wasn't really a need of going but he still earned quite a few merit badges he enjoyed those boys down there but his big interest was mechanical things he, he was uh, a bright boy, but he just was not interested in reading, writing, arithmetic. He really wanted to take things apart and see what made them tick, and if they didn't tick, to fix them so they did. He wasn't one to study in books. He wanted to do things with his hands. So he started a bicycle shop. He had it in a little woodshed in the back part of our house, and it was really nice. So people brought him parts of bicycles. They brought him bicycle chains and different parts. And uh, he and he repaired. And they brought him bicycles to repair too. Usually it was minor things like that the chain was tangled and or some of the links were broken or the spokes were bent or something like that. It wasn't any major thing, but. He had a lot of fun working with them, and he didn't earn much money. It cost more than to run the, get the parts than it did to fix them, but he had a lot of fun. I had always thought that he would go on after he got to school. He'd go into working with vehicles of some kind, repairing automobiles or or trucks or something like that. Of course, that never happened. But that was always what I had pictured Brian doing as he was an adult. Jerry, on the other hand, belonged to the 4-H club. That was met in homes around Haskinville, Narkport, and, those pla and Fremont, and those places. We had them one of the meetings at our house, I remember, or at least one, maybe more. And so he was interested in that, and he uh, wanted to get a calf of his own, so he bought one from Jones's, a registered calf, and they had only registered animals, and so uh, he bought one of those, and I remember the day he was going to get it was on a Saturday, and it was... Uh, weekend that we were going to Dean Jumbles for the weekend up in the Adirondack area. He just did not want to go getting that cat and going up there and visiting Dean Jumble. But we insisted on his going because it didn't make any difference. They, they had kept the calf and got it so that it could drink by itself and so forth. So one week wasn't going to matter. But he was disappointed, but he went anyway. Well, he got the calf, and he named her Hopeful. He was hopeful of having a whole herd of Guernsey cows. He worked with that calf, got him, uh, leading him around and getting him so he was, she was tame and and willing to go do what he wanted to and so forth. When she was two years old, she was going to have a calf. He was just like an anxious husband. He just watched her so closely and get home from school. He'd tear down there to make sure she was all right or home from work. I think it was during the summer that she was going to have her calf. But he'd get back from helping Floyd. He'd tear down the pasture. She was in the pasture all the while now because he wasn't milking her or he, she wasn't uh, 
giving milk or anything then. And he um, went down and there came the day that the calf was definitely due, and there was no calf. And he fretted and stewed what could have gone wrong, and why didn't she have a calf? And it did seem uh, odd because cows are are remarkable for having calves on the day they're supposed to, but she didn't anyway. He went down and checked her at night, and, and uh, she didn't have any calf. And, and then he went to work the next morning, and then he, and during the day, somebody had gone by there and said, I see you got a nice little calf running around the pasture down there. And when he got home, or that was about the time Jerry got home, he tore down there. He was so excited. And I just always have laughed at him because he acted like, like it was his own child. But anyway, he uh, it was a bull calf. He wanted to raise a herd from Hopeful, but he couldn't raise that one because it was a bull calf. He also bought another cow from Jones's. So he had two, or the other calf, and raised it to be a cow. But they, I, he didn't get calves from either one of them to start his herd that he wanted to. But he planned to take them to the fair anyway, the one hopeful he was going to take. So he led her daily and got her so she'd lead real nice the way cows are supposed to when they're breeding in the fair. And he curried her hair and hide good so that she was looked real smooth and he kept her toenails polished and kept her tail all combed and nice. He worked real hard to have her be a good show animal. And the time came to go to the fair and we he went down the day before and took her and got her all registered and everything and then we I wanted to go to the judging the next day and I was hurrying around to get ready to go so I'd be sure they would not miss any of it. And then my father says, well, of course, I'm going with you. And I hadn't even known that he wanted to go because he hadn't wanted to go to the fair the last few days of years. It was just too much for him. So we had to rush and rush and get, I felt bad because he wasn't going, he was going to be all tired out the time he got there because we had to rush of getting him dressed, but he didn't have his clean clothes on or anything, and I don't remember, I probably had to shave him and everything else. So anyway, we got there in time, and there was no sign of Jerry, and I thought he, the, all the other cows seemed to be standing with their uh, owners. They were all to wear white shirts and white pants and little black bow ties. They just looked so nice and they were all just kids, you know, 13, 14. And so I went looking for him. Here he was down on his hands and knees by a little puddle of water. <coughs> cleaning her toenails. I could have wrung his neck and had looked so nice in that white outfit. He was not one bit concerned about the mud on his knees. It was the mud on Hopeful's toenails that concerned him. He had polished them real carefully and then she'd gone and stepped in the mud. Crazy cow. So we watched the judging. They led them around and around the, uh, before the judges. And, and she was very good. She went along. She looked real nice. And, and once, a couple, three times, they called him out of the ring for the judges to look her, his cow over carefully. And I thought, oh, maybe he's going to win. But he didn't. But he did get honorable mention, so that made him feel good anyway, because there wasn't too many of them, so he really got some praise for all his work. He had to stay there 
I bought a wheat uh, with that cow because they had to stay in the stables for folks to go home through and, and see them. And so we uh, went down one night to take him food for the next day and we went in where the cow was and there was Jerry sound asleep. The, the, the barns were real cool. This was back then the fair was in the fall and uh, got cool nights and he was cuddled right up next to the cow sound asleep. I said I wished I had a camera to take that picture. But we didn't have. But anyway, the next time the Farm Journal came out, on the cover was that very same picture of a boy sound asleep in a fairground barn. And only that was a black and white cow. Of course, Jerry, being a Guernsey, she was red and white. Jerry was interested in the sports. In the fall, he did the wrestling. And in the spring, he did pole vaulting. In the wrestling, he set a record for a while for the shortest time to pin. But then Mike Kasai, our almost next door neighbor, took it away from him. He won. He did it in less time. And But in the pole vaulting, the last I knew, he still had the record. But I haven't heard but late years, so somebody may have uh, surpassed him now. When he went into the service, he had to sell his cows, and he had a horse, too, that he thought lots of. He sold them when he uh, went, got ready to go. He graduated in 1969, and the week after graduation, he went into the Marines. Debbie was sort of a loner. There was nobody in the close neighborhood near her age. In there, when she was 10 or 11, the, there was a Girl Scout group met at Marie. Moore's and Marie Meyer, she was then. And with them she had fun. They did things that Girl Scouts do, and she enjoyed that. And then the uh, Pauling girls used to come over for weekends, come once in a while. In the winter, they came for the Christmas boat vacation and stayed down with Jumbo's parents, and so that she had lots of fun with them. They formed a club, and the and Dick's girls would come up. Twins would come up once in a while too. So they'd have these club meetings, and they met in in Debbie's clothes closet upstairs, pretty close quarters. But they had a lot of fun. They had some kind of initiation thing that each of them had to do something in order to be members. I remember and they told about Kathy had to go, it was in the winter time, and Kathy had to go to the mailbox barefooted and get the mail and bring it and give it to her father, to Floyd, I mean. And so she did, and she thought, of course, she'd get good bawling out. But he never looked at her. He just took the mail, never even noticed that she was barefooted. So he didn't ball her out, so it was not very much of a punishment for her, except he had cold feet. Debbie had to fill his favorite cup with sand and leave it where he usually kept it, on the, or where it would be on the table where he'd see it. I don't know anything, I didn't know anything about this at the time. I've heard it since. And she said all he did was dump the sand over into another container. I suppose he thought that for some reason somebody in the house wanted sand, so he saved the sand, he washed the cup out, and used it. So nobody got very bold out for that either. They had a lot of fun. And Colleen were too little at that time, and, and Robin was more into by herself reading. 
the twins came over once in a while and all of them would have good time together. In fact, one summer they all went to Chambers Camp and Debbie said everybody in her her cabin was a niece to her except the lady that was a chaperone. So that was they all called her Aunt Debbie. They thought that was a big deal. Jerry got along fine in basic training in the Marines. He had, being a farm boy, he had lots of exercise and used to hard work, so it wasn't easy, but it wasn't difficult like it was for a lot of them. He used to say he felt sorry for those kids that had never done much of any work or exercise, and they really were hurting when the night came. Then the second year of his Marine Corps time, he was in Vietnam. That was not a good time. He, he, it was hard to listen to the news and worry over them, but he came back all safe and sound. He had he got two Purple Hearts because of minor injuries and one quite serious one to his foot. But other than that, he came through it fine. In Debbie's high school days, the Youth for Christ in Bath and Canona built a building, and then they changed the name to Family Life Ministries. They had a rally every Saturday evening, and Debbie went to most of them. Sometimes I took the whole load, but the whole neighborhood took turns taking the load of kids around Haskinville down. It was a nice time for them, give them the right things they should hear, and, and they had lots of fun down there. About this time, Dick got a call from Houghton College asking him to come there and work as an administrator. So he decided to do that. The family stayed in Canisteo because they wanted Karen to finish out her senior year there. Karen was very much in her class name, Bruce Fossard. I remember when we went to the graduation, Bruce got most of the awards. He was just a very bright boy and did very well in school. Karen went to Houghton for a little while, but then she quit and she and Bruce got married. Carol didn't want to leave Canisteo School, so she stayed with a family in, a, in Canisteo to go to school there, and Cheryl went with her parents. And so they graduated in different schools, and there was no way to go to all the graduations. Of course, I went to the one in Canisteo because I, it was easier than going to Houghton. In the meantime, back in the Volca, Debbie became very interested in a boy named Phil Wolfson. She was more interested in him than he was in her when they, when she first saw him. So she went to him and claimed that she could not do math, and that he was so good in it, would he help her with her math lessons? Since then, she's laughed over that and said, to he ought to take over the keeping of the books. They were both in the same class, and so they were going to graduate together, and they planned to be married right after graduation. In the meantime, my sister had worked in Rochester for many years, 20 years in fact, and she moved to Hornell and took an apartment, and that was nice. She came up every once in a while for a weekend and, and sometimes during the week she'd be up for a few days. She didn't work or anything so she'd come and go if she pleased. Debbie had a pretty wedding. Pat and Bob came up for the weekend and Pat arranged the flowers. They'd gotten big tubs of daisies and she picked out the nice looking ones and they bought 
some or got some flowers from Jesse Eisman, pink and blue delphinium, and they worked those in with them, and they just made pretty bouquets of those white daisies. And her, her maid of honor was Kathy Pauling, and then a uh, Mary Ann, Phil's sister, and Sue Shaw were bridesmaids. Sue was her very best friend in high school, and she still is a good friend. They still get back and forth sometime during the year, each year. She lives in Washington now, but, but she is home to this area every once in a while. And, uh, and Dan Weaver was the best man. Dick Wilson and Bruce were ushers. They had and Doug Prentice and, and Pam Wilson for Ring Bear and, Bra and Flower Girl. They were so cute. Both of them were so scared at the rehearsal. They cried and cried. But the day of the wedding, they marched down there like little si soldiers. She was married, of course, in the Haskellville Church and held the reception down there in the basement as the other girls had. And then they left after that for a honeymoon. And when they came back, they lived in a trailer on Dick uh, Wilson's farm. And he worked for Phil, uh, for Dick, for a while. It was an interesting summer. Debbie knew uh, sewing real well. She took homemaking in school. In fact, she made her own wedding dress, so she could sew very well. But she hadn't had much experience cooking. Every once in a while she'd call up and say, how do you make this, or what do I do? And then sometimes she'd say, now what do I do? It's a bit funny. But it was the only chance I ever had to do that. The other ones all lived so far away, it'd be long distance to call up and say, mother, what do I do now? So I just had Debbie to help with that, but she never didn't get over too often, but she called me up a lot. In the fall of that year, my very first grand, great-grandchild was born. That was Joshua, and he was born to Karen and Bruce. I didn't get to see him for a little while, but then I did, and he was a beautiful little boy. And just enjoyed him, what little I saw of him. Robin graduated that same year that Debbie did, up in her school, up near where they lived, in, near Cambridge. They, all the girls, went to that same school. And so, of course, I couldn't go to her graduation. That was too far away. I missed out on all those that lived away. I wanted to get to all their graduations, of course, but that was not possible. Kim got married that fall. She married a boy from their church named Gary King. She had two more years of school, so she wanted to go on and finish because she always wanted to be a nurse like her mother. 1974 brought more babies into our family. Daniel Floyd was born to Deb and Phil, and then and Maria was born to Kim and Gary. Robin graduated the same year that Debbie did, and she went to Holton, and this year Kathy graduated from the same school up in Greenwich, and they, I couldn't get to any of those graduations because they were too far away. Kathy went to Houghton, too, and she went to Houghton, too. We had a lot of our grandchildren went to Houghton later on. We had quite a bunch there.
I continue to have the summer picnic each year. Sometime in the summer, they pick a date when one of them that was away was home. Why, that would be the time we'd set the picnic. We didn't have any special date. They always had a good time, and I was glad that I had a big house and a big yard because they were, the, they were outgrowing my house already. Um, but, but there was the big yard where they could play baseball or pitch horseshoes or do something or just sit on the porch and talk. It was always a nice time. I always enjoyed that. The fall was the same as it had been other years. I had Thanksgiving there, and that became quite a project with our family growing. We, I remember that year I set up three tables, one in the parlor and one in the living room and one in the kitchen. But we enjoyed the meal and had a good time. And Christmas was the same way. That was crowded, but the families pretty well stayed at their own homes that year for Christmas because they weren't. They had children by then, of course, and, and uh, they wanted to be home for Christmas. The twins had graduated that year, and they also went to Houghton. And in the summer of 75, Chris graduated, and she went to Houghton, so we had four Paulings there. In the fall of 1975, Matthew Laverne was born to Deb and Phil. He had a bad start and had to stay in the hospital a while, and I had Danny for a few days. So Floyd didn't have to stop there on his way home on Saturday. He'd say, you, you can't guess where I've been. And of course, I knew he'd been over to see Danny. In the same fall, Gerald, Gerald was married to Kathy Curry. They lived in the little house that Gerald had built on the Toon Road. David Aloysius was a year and a half old then, and we enjoyed him. So shortly after Jerry and Kathy were married, their house burned. They lost all their wedding presents and uh, all their clothes, everything. They lost everything. It was a sad time. And they moved in with us. Of course, our house was empty then because Debbie was married and gone. And, and so there was nobody there, so it was nice having somebody else move in with us and we you know, had, had so much fun with David. Jerry drove truck in the winter when he wasn't flying so he was gone quite a lot of the time and Kathy and I got really acquainted in those days that we had together there. Thanksgiving and Christmas were the same as they'd been other years. We enjoyed them. So I was uh, working hard at the warehouse every day, grading potatoes and shipping potatoes to chip factories. They had to be kept in at a certain temperature all through the winter. The winter, so he had to check each in time, wherever he stored his potatoes to make sure the furnace was working and that they were kept at that same temperature and because he sold them all for chip, just chip factories. He, uh, one time when he was loading a truck, a load of potatoes, he slipped as he stepped from the warehouse to the back of the truck and grabbed the iron and he hurt his elbow and arm real bad. He had a big black and blue strip from the middle of his forearm up almost to his shoulder. But he, uh, it wasn't time for his doctor's appointment or anything, so he didn't do anything about it and didn't think anything about being important. And in the last part of 
February, he began feeling real bad. He didn't, he'd get up in the morning and I'd say, well, the potatoes are all gone. Now all you're doing is grating seed. Can't you just stay home a day? And he said, no, i got to keep working at it. And he'd go every day and come back every day. Always so tired. And so he had a regular doctor's appointment, and the doctor said, well, I'll, he told him how tired he felt, and he said, I'll send you for a series of tests. So he sent him, and they gave him the works, and upper and lower GI, and EKG, and chest X-ray, and all the things that he thought he needed testing, he did. And then he scolded him for not uh, telling him about that bad bruise on his arm because he said, I could have sent you something. I sh you should have been taking something and not let that big white and blue spot stay there. So he went the long, the middle of March uh, back for another appointment. And he read the report to him. He says, Every one of these checks out perfect. All oh, you're healthier than I am, he said. And he just let it go at that, and Floyd still felt so bad. He didn't know why he felt so bad if he was in such perfect health. And that was, uh, that was the 13th of March he had that doctor's appointment. And it, he was bowling right along. It was the end of the bowling season, and they were going to have their state tournaments. And he had said, this year it was in Albany, so it was especially nice to go that year because that was where Gene lived up in that area. And so when we went to the state tournament, we could go and spend the time with her because it took two days always. But he said he didn't feel good. He didn't know he on to go. But uh, Jerry and Phil and Bruce and Floyd were the ones on the team. And uh, Phil and Jerry both wanted to go to the state tournament so bad, and he sort of hated to let them down. So he went, and we did have a good time at Jean's. And this was uh, 21st of March. And he had, he didn't, usually he bowled both sections on Saturday. There'd be the singles and the doubles. And, uh, but this time he said he just didn't feel well enough to do them both. He'd have to do one of them on Sunday. So he left in the morning to go bowling, and I went to church with Gene Jumble, but I said I'd get back to the bowling alley before he was through bowling, because... It ran from about 12 till whenever they ended, and we'd be out of church at 12, so we could get there for most of the excitement. So we went to church, and we came back to the bowling alley, and, and uh, everybody was just standing around, and Kim came up and said, uh, Grandpa, uh, fainted while he was bowling, and they've taken him to the hospital. And I said, oh, I suppose it was so hot in there. It always gets so hot and stuffy in those bowling alleys, and everybody's smoking and everything. So I, we just went right to the hospital, but when we got there, uh, they were all very glum, and Bruce said, Mom, you got to know, he never breathed all the way to the hospital. I was sat right in there with him. But I, it just didn't register somehow. I just thought, well, Bruce just as excited and he doesn't know. But then they came in and told me that he was dead. It was a terrible shock. Just never, I just never 
dream that that was going to be the answer they'd give me. I knew he didn't feel well, but what was there a matter with him that would kill him? It was just uh, an awful thing to go through. I had to try to reason it out and try to believe that that was right. It was an awful time. So we went right home. I went up to Bruce and Aaron and Phil and Deb were, and Jerry and Kathy went together. And they stayed at Pat's and Floyd and I and Bruce and Aaron stayed at Jean's. The body couldn't be sh was going to have to be shipped by plane, and it wouldn't get there till Wednesday. So we, they set the calling hours for Thursday all day long because the, the, we knew it was going to be a big, big crowd, so many business acquaintances and so many relatives. And it was a long, long day because there was just a line waiting all the time to come through. I got through it all right. They fixed a place upstairs for us to alternate going down, but I stayed by the casket most of the day. And the funeral was on Friday. There was a big, big crowd at the funeral, too. Dr. Patty, the doctor we had, came to the funeral home. And he looked at him and he said, he thought that he had a blood clot in his lungs. They had not given any reason for his death up there. Just I forgot the term they used, but it was just a natural causes it meant. And uh, he said he thought there was a blood clot in his lungs by the coloring on his face. I, I don't know if he really thought that or if he wanted to he couldn't believe. He thought a great deal of him personally. He was always saying he was. He wrote me a nice letter afterward, telling me what a good friend Floyd had been to him and how he admired him and so forth. And he probably did feel real bad to think he had diagnosed something that would have saved this. But I guess it was all in God's good timing. Then came the decisions that had to be made. We, of course, had the reading of the will, and that was no surprises in that. And then we had to decide what to do about all that equipment and all those potatoes that were left, and there was so much to decide, and I just felt overwhelmed. I remember um, one time before that, Floyd had owned land, owned land around the Boca of Dyer Hill and, and up on Jacob's Ladder and on Job's Corners, I mean, and like that. And then he rented land around the Boca, too, so that all around was parts of his machinery left in the field. And I remember one day I said to Bruce, oh, what if anything should happen? Floyd, I wouldn't know anything what to do. Floyd says, says, I know where everything is, and I'll take care of it. I've thought of that so many times since that was such a boon to me. He did step in and moved all the machinery. We had to have an auction, and we had to set it quite quick. This was March 21st that he died, and it should be right off because in April, May, but especially April, farmers would begin buying their machinery that they needed for the next year's farming. So we had an, an auction set in April, and all the kids came and helped with it. They came and stayed two or three days getting all the machinery lined up and all the tractors in a row and all the plows in a row trucks in a row and so forth. There was so much to sell. And they 
all came and were to sort of took care of handling the money. The rest of them all did whatever jobs needed to be done. I didn't even go. I didn't want to be near it. I just stayed home. But anyway, they did well. We sold off everything and cleared out the warehouse. And it was done. Then life got back to everyday living. I was glad that Kathy and Jerry were there. Gave other people in the house and not making it quite so hard as it would have been if nobody else had been there. They were building their new house up um, where the old one had burned. And that was taking their time and their interest quite a lot. I've always been so grateful that I learned to drive a car. That would never have taken place if Floyd hadn't had to go to the service. So there were good things came of that. But I had a lot to see to running around to settle things and going to the lawyer and settling the estate and all that that has to be done after a time like this. And I and my sister was sick real bad for quite a while. I was in she was in and out of the hospital and I was down there with her quite a lot. But she came home and stayed with me after she got out of the hospital. She was there over the summer and into the fall. And I got uh, sick that summer too. I had surgery in September. And uh, I went to Bonilla's for a little while after I left the hospital, but then I came home because my sister was real sick and she was home there. And I, I got along fine as far as um, healing and so forth. But it was hard uh, because Fern was so sick. She had an apartment in Hornell, I guess I mentioned that before. Uh, but she knew she couldn't keep it, so she, we all went down there and sort of divided up her things between the families. Different ones got different things. And I don't know just what I remember. Pat got a, a pretty set of dishes that she bought in England. And now today, Pat has added to that, so she has a nice big set. It's a beautiful set. Well, a um, very popular set now with the people. They buy, I can buy it here in America. And, of course, anything anybody else didn't want, we gave to Kathy because everything was gone in her household. Uh, where the house had burned. So that made it nice. I remember she had a big basket of things, just kitchen utensils and ordinary things that you need that the others had, so they didn't want. At Thanksgiving time, we were planning to um, have them all home there because Jerry was going to have the windows put in his house. He had gone to Bob Crain worked for a lumber company there in Socrates, and and he could get the windows through a company in Syracuse at a better rate than Jerry could have if he'd gone as an individual. So he went up early in the morning and got them, and the rest of them were coming that next day to that day to get them and when we but we had a tragedy that day my sister Fern died very suddenly it was a, a great shock and a very disappointment because I thought she was going to get better and there was and we would just be the two of us cause, 
and we could do things together that we never had done because I was always tied up with family things. But that was the way it was. They all came to help put in the windows, and we had Thanksgiving there. And then we had calling hours on Friday, and the funeral was on Saturday. So that we got through that another time that was trying and hard, but God is always faithful. Christmas time was coming again, and we 